Hi everyone and welcome to season two of Maple's Hosted Pro, where we talk with top talents about everything from marketing to business and so much more. Our guest today is a public speaker, TEDx talker, ex-marketing agency owner and serial tech startup co-founder. A digital marketing and technology expert who works on the BBC Breakfast, BBC New Channels, BBC Watch Hog, The One Show, Rip Off Retain, and on countless radio shows. He's a futurist who trains companies in how the future of marketing, work, and technology will change our world for the better. Please welcome Dan Sattergern. Hi there. Yeah, lovely to be here, and thanks very much for having me. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. I'm very happy to have you. Um, today we're going to speak a little bit about AI, the future of work, digital, digital marketing, just dive right in. So we've had some 2023, I'll say big trends. Uh, we had TikTok live, we had reels, um, shorts is coming up on YouTube. What's going to be the big trend in 2024? Well, it's a great question. The big trend has been one of the it's a really interesting point about trends and around, you know, will Twitter be part of it with it, you know, what it's doing and AI is going to be part of it and thing. But the, the bigger kind of macro trends around this, I don't think are going to change massively, which is video. Video is going to be hugely important. It was in 2023. It started to be in 2022. And heck, I'll be honest with you, I'm so old that, you know, I was saying that video and mobile would be big, you know, after 10 years ago. And I was, you know, as I, well, I'm a, I suppose I'm a tech futurist and my job is to predict the future. So it's not that clever. And you, you could see by the trend what was going to happen, right? Exactly the same as, you know, mobile got more and more important in life. So, so is video. But the big thing really for us is the fact that video creation now, because of AI and these other tools and other clever things you can do, video creation is now into the hands of the masses. This is the time of the democratization of video content. And so normally what you'd have to get Hollywood to do or you'd have to have a large budget to do, you might be able to do in 2024 with tiny budgets with just one or two people. And that's the difference. We're going to get this, uh, this, I don't know, this wave, this almost tsunami of video content. Now, in some respects, that's amazing because it's great. Democratization of, of you know, production of things and costs coming down, brilliant. But of course, as we all, we're all marketeers, as we know, as the noise increases, so there's a problem with signal, right? So there's a problem with connection, right? If everyone's got a TV, we've got a problem with TV. However, people, remember, people said this when YouTube first started. Everyone could have a YouTube channel. And so everyone went, oh my God, TV's going to die. And TV, of course, has started to die, of course, but that's a generational change. Then they said video would die because there'd be too much video. We haven't seen that, have we? All we've seen is an increase in video, more people liking video content. The more authentic, the better. And I think actually, even though a lot of people are predicting that AI is going to make things less authentic, I actually think it's going to make things more creative. There's more and more data that's coming out now that shows that using AI tools as marketeers means you actually become more creative rather than less. Can you elaborate on that? Can you explain that? Because I'm trying to figure out how you become more creative because I think it's kind of, it's taking away the thing that, well, I'll just go to ChatGPT and I'll have it write 20,000 posts for me for the upcoming year. So where's the creative part? No, that's a, that's a really great point. So don't get me wrong. This is exactly what I teach on the AI marketing course. You know, I literally teach entrepreneurs and solo entrepreneurs and marketeers how do they use AI so they can do a lot of the heavy, you know, the heavy lifting is done by AI. Yeah, but we've got to remember when we say AI, we kind of make a bit of a mistake. It's a bit like saying computers. Well, okay, cool. Back in the day, if you were a graphic designer and you didn't use a Mac, you were told off, weren't you? You know, if you were a graphic designer, you didn't use Adobe or whatever, people were like, what? You don't have a Mac using Adobe? What are you doing? You're not a graphic designer, right? And I know because I wasn't a graphic designer. I had a PC. Everyone laughed at me, right? Because <laughs> you just, just didn't do it. Of course you didn't, right? Now, but it's the same principle now. It's like if you're just using one type of AI for everything, well, A, that's not particularly creative. And B, that's not particularly clever from a technological point of view. Now, don't get me wrong. It's only because I'm a massive geek and this is what I teach, right? So, so you know, there's four or five different types of AI you can use for different things. Yeah, you know, as, as we know in the creative world, there's lots of different types of videos you can create and images you can create with different types of AI. There's tens of thousands of tools and hundreds of thousands of, uh, you know, startups and ideas out there around this AI space. Lots of them are wraparounds for this base technology as you talk about, which is GPT, right? If you're using chat GPT at the moment, which is 3.5 rather than four, please, please, please stop doing that. 
buy the £20 a month, don't you know, ask your boss or just pay for it yourself, by the way. This is your own personal development, right? Because 3.5 is like asking a 16 year old. Yeah. Whereas ChatGPT4 is like asking a 21 year old, right? If you get really advanced, you could use something like Claude, and Claude 2.1 is like asking a 27 year old, right? So the, if they're getting cleverer and cleverer. So the creative part now becomes how good are you at prompt writing? And how good are you at instructing the machine to get the very best out of the machine? Now, this is a really, really interesting point though, because the machine doesn't come up with stuff, you do, okay? So it's like saying we're gonna be less creative when we've got mobile phones in our pockets that have got cameras. What are we talking about? Like everyone suddenly started doing Instagram videos, right? So, <laughs> Like, literally, this is the lovely stats. They, they think, well, they actually, they know. In 150 years, well, I'll put it a different way. There's been about 200 billion images created using generative AI, okay? This is the same that they predict as in the first 150 years of photography as it stood, okay? Yeah, so in a year, we've created as much as 150 years. Now, some people would say, oh, but it's, it's not creative. But it is, isn't it? It's creating. You can become more creative because you are the creator. You can do stuff now using Mid Journey, Stable Diffusion, all these other AIs that would cost you, you know, thousands of pounds to do to set up as a photo shoot. And then now it looks the same. So if you truly believe that AI doesn't make you more creative, it's just because you're not using AI. It's just because you're not, you know, if, if you honestly believe, well, my job as a marketeer is to, is to create the Photoshop and therefore, and it, is it? Well, if, if, it's, if your job as a marketeer is not the visionary behind the experience, then you're really a project manager. And that, you know, and I've been both, by the way. I've also run an events company as well. So I'm in no way am I besmirching that part of the world. It's just the fact that marketeers now, especially in digital marketing, we have the chance to be more creative than ever. You know, much more creative than when the computer first came out because we now have computers on top of computers. We now have a whole team of AIs that can become like a mini agency. So you can create anything that you want pretty much by next year you'll be able to create pretty much anything you want if this makes you less creative you have to have a chat with yourself about what you believe creativity is okay i, I don't mean i don't mean that in a mean way it's just literally you know and by the way if people are thinking marketing you know marketing is you know getting more people to buy our products and services absolutely old you know old-fashioned way of looking at it is absolutely right there is no way that ai doesn't help you do that because AI can give you hyper-personalization. It can let you create 10,000 videos that are personified. Yeah, things that just in a madman's dreams, you wouldn't be able to do as an individual. You couldn't do it. This becomes the, the, you know, the marketing equivalent of marketing to one person, to one demographic, to one psychographic, not to 10,000. And then saying, well, my click-through rate's really low. Well, your click-through rate's gonna be low. You know, you look at it from just an email marketing point of view. If you could send out a thousand different emails, to a thousand different people using AI, which you can. So it learns what they like or what they don't like and changes on the nuance of their time and where they are and sends it out at the right time. All this is possible, right? This is what we teach in the AI marketing course. This becomes the best marketing in the world. Yeah, because it does. It, your click-through rates will go up. Yeah, if you can create adverts, you can create a thousand adverts rather than one. You're gonna learn from the adverts, right? This is what pay-per-click advertising has been teaching us for years. But if you can now suddenly create 10,000 adverts and learn from them, your marketing is only going to get better. It can't get worse. However, if you are so lazy as a marketeer to let ChatGPT do all your copywriting for you without checking it, then, yeah, you need to go on a course because you shouldn't do that. So, okay, so we have this as a trend and you, and you were touching this just a little bit, but do you think the one one-to-one -one advertising marketing is going to take form like using what we see as like the future of work with using ai and then we're going to be personalizing everything i feel like it's back to single single people talking to single people like it's not a persona anymore it's not like uh we're not talking to an audience that is like a general generation of age kind of between 24 to 32 which is such a wide range these days 
this is the only way that marketing can get better as a discipline is to understand that what we did was put clump people into clumsy generalizations because it was easier for us to do so. Yeah. So we could say, oh, right. And, the, you know, the old classic where people say, oh, everyone needs my product. You know, it's 18 to 80. And you just go, oh, God, oh, God, these people, what are we going to do? You know, because, you know, it's an impossible brief. Right. But then you then you, then you take them yourself. You say, look, you know, 25 to 32, that's too large a demographic. You need a persona. Right. And this is what we were taught to do. Went from demographic to personas to psychographics. This is what we were taught. However, AI gives us the ability to change that completely. And so it becomes marketing to the one. It's the magical moments of marketing that you can create. And you can only create that wow factor when you have enough data on the person to create a truly personalized experience. Now that isn't possible as one person in a marketing team. It's just not possible. But it is possible with a huge amount of data and it is possible with a very clever series of machines. Now, will this be the future of marketing? I can guarantee you it's the future of great marketing. It's the future of successful marketing because it's exactly the same principles I taught 20 years ago when I was, when I was teaching guerrilla marketing. It's the same principle. It's how do you create a positive psychological experience for that person so they change their mind or they move down the funnel, as we used to call it. Now, funnels now are out of date because you know, we know it's too complicated to call it a funnel. You can call it a customer journey. You can call it anything you want, but if you don't have the data to know where that person is psychologically, culturally, demographically, all this stuff, so you can deliver the right message, then I have a feeling that somebody else will do that. And as I always like to say, you know, AI is not going to replace you, but somebody using AI most probably will. And we're very close in marketing to getting to that point where actually our job's going to be how do you manage the technology stack you have? It's not going to be how creative you are or how clever you think you are, because in the end, I hate to say it, and marketers always hate it when I say it, but our opinions don't matter. It's just the customers. Yeah, that's right. This is the golden hour for marketers. This is now the, the place where they, the, the turning point for marketers. This is now where they need to learn a tool, just like they learned, you know, HubSpot or they used to learn Facebook ads, or they used to learn how to use Instagram. I mean, this is another tool and people should not be afraid to say, this is the tool that I'm using. It helps me be more clever, sophisticated, um, reach to more people, do the process of, of info. I mean, you know, I'm thinking about how it used to be like a very important part to know how to use Excel, Excel sheets. And you need to know how to pivot and you need to know how to filter. And you won't need to do that anymore. You will have a machine that will learn how to do that for you. So you will see the results and your work will be faster. And that is what's going to make you better in the market yeah. as a marketer. But isn't it, I, mean, I was just talking to somebody, uh, somebody in a different sector the other day, in the HR sector. And I think it's always interesting to, to look outside of your sector because when you look inside your sector, you can get a very emotive response. But whenever I do keynotes for people, I always talk about other sectors. And then it kind of lands home to them. It's the same for them, right? So in HR, people you say, well, I, I want to go on my gut feel. You know, I've got to go on my intuition because I'm an HR specialist and I've got all this years of experience, right? And I was like, for a long time, I've been saying, well, that's most probably not the best way of doing HR. Also, calling it human resources kind of says something about, you know, that's not a great term for it anyway. Anyway, it's not the point. You know, but, you know calling people, you know, stock capital and human resources, it's you know, most probably not. That's not the nicest uh, bit. It's not just semantics. It's just how you feel about your customers. Anyway, point, <laughs> point being is they can now use a, a lot of data, yeah, to now start making some decisions, which are data-driven decisions. Now, they used to use their gut feel, and now they can start using data. Now, does this mean that HR is going to disappear? No. But it does mean that you know, the person doing HR that does it from a slightly biased and kind of odd point of view and thinks they're kind of godlike and makes these decisions, that, that time's most probably done. Same with lawyers. You know, is the time for lawyers gone? Most probably not, but we're going to need a lot less lawyers because being technically brilliant at law is most probably what the machines do really well. You know, are we going to need, are we going to have less doctors? That's probably not, but doctors are going to have more time to be doctors and humane and be you know, nice to people because the machine will do the diagnosis because the machines do the diagnosis quicker. But as you rightly say, this is no different to when computers first came out. Computers came out and everyone's like, oh, accountancy is all over because of Excel. Rubbish, what are you talking about? There's more than ever, right? No, maybe not more than ever, but there's still quite a few, right? It's actually the same with engineering. Engineering's over because we brought out the CAD machine and all this stuff. 
nonsense. It becomes more and more and more, right? Now, same with marketing. AI does not get rid of marketing, far from it, but it does get rid of mediocre marketing because it, the market won't allow it, right? So it just means if your marketing is old fashioned, same principle. If I was, you know, and that, by the way, flyer marketing this probably works quite well now, but if I was, was I was writing handwritten notes to everyone and handing them to the, in the street one to one, I, that wouldn't work really, I don't think. Yeah, it wouldn't work, but it might do because it's quite cute and people might like it. But it yeah, it's like, like, oh, that's weird. That's different. Oh, that's guerrilla marketing. Oh, I quite like that. And that's you know, positive, positive psychological impact, which probably would work. But the point being is, it could only work if I knew who to write the notes to, correct? Yeah, same principle. Now, this is what AI allows us to do. AI allows us to become much cleverer with our marketing. But if I was still doing stuff with pens and paper, I couldn't scale my business. I couldn't scale the, you know, the brands we work with. I couldn't train people how to do marketing because we use computers. Next, as you say, it's going to be using AI, uh, whether we like it or not. Now, there's lots of other facets of marketing that are going to change, but I would say definitely one of the bigger drivers is, is learning how to use AI. So we will learn how to use AI and we will be really great at it. And then I'm going to touch the point where um, we need authenticity and we need the real thing. We need to feel like the people that are talking to us are real. We have creator economy, which is exploding now. It's going to be 24, 20, 25. It's going to be all about creator's economy. And AI is coming to that as well. It's kind of making its way over there as well. And how are we going to make sure that we keep the authenticity using AI with having influencers or whatever it is you want to call it, um, combined. Yeah, that's a, it's a really great question. And uh, normally on podcasts, I never argue with the get with the host, ha <laughs> ha, but I'm going to slightly now. Now, and the reason, yeah, the, but the reason being is one of the big trends of 2024, you know, we talked about it going to be video, but the bigger trend behind it is going to be not only AI created video, but AI influences. Yeah, actual AI influencers. They are they are big, they've been around for quite a long time. I was on the radio about six months talking about it and talking about things and the potential of them. Right now, these are these things that are not real at all, as in they are computer graphic simulations of a person. Yeah, and depending on how old you are, you'll you'll know them. You'll know the names of them if you're very if you're younger than I am. If you're older than I am, you won't even know that they exist. Right, <laughs> but they do, and there were billions of dollars. Okay. Now, on mass, this is one of the most exciting bits of marketing, but it does put that challenge around authenticity because actually you're fine. This is what the data is showing that people like the AI influencers more than traditional influencers, even though they know that they are made up. Okay. This is not the fact that these people believe that the AI is real. This is them knowing that the AI is false, but still liking it no matter what. Now, this is mind blowing for lots of people. And it's a complete change in the way I was looking at it, because I believed that it was just stupidity. I believe you know, it's a big lie. And as soon as people realize that they're an AI, they'll be like, well, pff, never speaking to it again. No, no, that's an old man talking. That's an old man talking. Young people, and when I say young, I mean under the age of 35. Um, so I am that old. <laughs> they don't mind. And if you go uh, to my daughter's generation, they like them more. They like the fact they're AI more than they like the fact they're real. So this brings in this whole thing about, okay, what is authentic? What is authentic and what isn't? And I have a feeling, a bit like with privacy and lots of other things, they are human constructs that change with generations. Okay? The way my daughter views privacy is completely different to the way I do. She doesn't even question. I'm like, oh, you've got to be worried about the AI taking your data. And she's like, I don't care, Dad. And I'm like, oh, you must care. Data is really important. She's like, what? I'm not doing anything wrong. Why would I care that it follows me around the internet? It's good because I get the adverts I want. And I can remember going, no, no, block all the cookies, block everything. Oh, my God, GDPR and all that kind of stuff. The next generations aren't going to care. They're just going to care that they, they have a nice experience with something and they enjoy their lives more, right? It's about instant gratification on a mass scale. Now, psychologically, should we be standing up against AI influencers and saying, actually, they are wrong? Like, should we be standing, I go on radio and I talk about not necessarily standing up against Instagram, but Instagram is known for not being particularly positive for teenage girl experience, right? It creates mental health problems. Social media does en masse. So does mobile use en masse, right? So we need to teach the next generation of the dangers. But at the same time, as marketeers, we can't just go, 
oh, we don't want to use mobile because we don't like it. Oh, we're not going to use Instagram because we don't like it. This will be the same for AI influencers. It's going to be a fascinating world in the next couple of years. That moment of authenticity that you talked about, will AI influence be able to pass that off? Will brands themselves buy their own AI influencers? Or will they have them, you know, will you create one for your own brand? Will you create salespeople for your own brands? Will you create chatbots for your own brands? What's the next step? And it's not going to be because I'm a tech futurist. So I always talk about holograms and the future of the world and all that. But if you take it down to marketing in the smaller areas, right? It's because it, it's really interesting. If you go onto a website and you know you're talking, you're talking to a chatbot, and it's quite an intelligent one, not one of the ones from the last three or four years, but it's an AI, you know, stimulated one. It knows brand values, it knows what it's doing, it's learning every every time it does something. And you have a positive experience. Are you going to care that it was a robot? And the answer is no. No, of course not. And also, it's, it's not a robot. It's just a, it's just a decision tree, right? If it's AI on top of that, and then you interact with it, and it's in a social media environment, will you feel cheated because it's not a real person? I feel that I'd feel cheated. If someone replied to me with an email that I didn't think they'd written, I might feel cheated. But, yeah, but I'm an old, I'm an old person. The next generation might not care, right? And also, the next, next generation might, you know, it might get to the bit very, very soon where AI messaging is better than human messaging. And then where, you know, therefore, why would you not use AI? You know, it's a bit like me saying, oh, we do customer service, but we only do it on the phone because people hate emails. And the next generation, like, you're not phoning me. I'll kill you if you phone me. <laughs> we, we, only do, we only do SMS text messaging because people love it. <laughs> what? No, they don't. They hate it. What are you talking about, right? So your customer's view is the most important bit. Yours isn't. So it's going to be fascinating to see in the future as we are customer centric and customer driven, will marketeers like me have to accept that AI influencers are going to be part of their marketing mix? I have a feeling we might, we might not for a couple of years, but it's worth thinking about for 2024. I care about experience. I care about feeling good. And I don't care about, this is a big one. I don't care about two or five or 10 years from now. I want the now. Now is what I care about. If in 10 years, someone will use my data from 10 years ago because I gave my phone permission to use my data, I don't mind. I'm not doing anything wrong. I mean, this is, this is where we're going. We're going to, okay, which is going to happiness. People want happiness. And it might be that AI can help us achieve happiness. Absolutely. Again, amen to that. This is exactly what I talked about on my TEDx talk when I talk about the future of work is not what you think, it's not what you feel, it's what you love. Right? I truly believe that the future of work has to be what you love and has to be around getting people to be happier. And marketing's job will be to get people to buy products, services, most probably more experiences than ever before because people are striving to be happy. In a world which is you know, continually moving at a faster and faster pace, in a world which isn't giving them happiness and other things, our job is to provide some of that happiness. And how we do that, well, that's really up to you. Know, you know, AI, as you rightly said, it's just one tool to do that. Creativity is another tool to do that. Data is going to be another tool to do that. How we think about it independently and entrepreneurially, that'll be another thing. You know, this is why I talk about the fifth industrial revolution in my new book. This is the point now. We're at that point where it's not like it was before. It's not about networks. It's not about connectivity. It's not about the internet of things. It's about how do you imply a level of intelligence over the top of all those things? And that intelligence brings everything together, but you can only do that as individuals, as emotionally intelligent, because there's no point in using artificial intelligence if you're not emotionally intelligent, because all you're going to do is make things worse or make it very inefficient, yeah? It's, a lot of people think that in marketing, and this is a classic, in marketing, you can get the machine to do all the marketing, yeah? And that's fine, because you do it's exactly what I teach on the AI marketing course, but you still need to know what good marketing is to be able to say whether it's good or not. You know, the machine can create a tweet in your voice and your image and you can go, okay, great, I like that. And it can go out and you can get the feedback just from, you know, putting stuff out and getting feedback from your customers and doing it the old fashioned way. But I still believe there's some kind of intuition of, in good marketing where you go, oh, no, that's a good advert, or oh, that's a good email, that's a good thing, right? You've still got to be the boss of the machine. The machine can't be the boss of you. Yeah. Now, again, if it comes to the point, and I think it might do in the next few years, where 
AI is so good that you don't need to be involved in the process, then we have a deep issue as a marketing as an industry, right? Now, if the next generation believe in AI to the extent they might do, is in they might start literally. There are people now that are that are that they're creating AI girlfriends or AI digital clones of themselves and then selling that girlfriend experience or boyfriend experience, right? Now, you might think this is a bit of a weird thing to think about, but if you think about that, but you add on top of that the idea of work, well then why can't I digitally clone myself as a marketeer and then I give you the right to talk to me as an expert? So right now I can create and I have created, you can literally go use a GPT, uh, with these thing called GPTs, and you can, you have GPT plus, you can literally go and ask me for a quote about the future of work. Now, based on the four books that I've written, it will create you a quote. And I'll be honest with you, they're pretty good. You know, they're pretty good, right? They are, they're pretty good, right? Right. Now, if you're really clever about it, and again, this could be the future, the podcast like this, because you can clone my voice with anything we've just done the last five minutes, you can clone my voice in 11 labs. You can do so for about, I think it's literally, I think it starts at a dollar. Yeah, I think it goes up to $11 a month or whatever, but you could digitally clone my voice now, right? You could then ask me the questions that you asked me, digitally clone your own voice, ask me the questions you did, and then you could write the answers for me, and then that could be the podcast. Yeah, very, very soon, this is no word of a lie, by the way, very, very soon with things like Hey Jen, you could do the same, but with video, okay? So you can then create a clone of myself doing this moment, creating a clone, and then getting that to say the stuff. So it would look like a video of me and you talking, but it'd be completely fake, okay? Now, this, in some people's minds, is terrifying, yeah? Terrifying, because we now live in a post-truth world, and we have done most probably for quite a few years. But now the cost has come down to pennies in the pound, it is insanely cheap to do this. So that means every brand can. Now, will young people be offended by that kind of content? Will young people, in fact, say, I can't believe anything, therefore I'm gonna to listen to nothing? I'm not sure, I'm really not sure. My moral compass says creating these things, if it creates a positive human experience and puts them more towards happiness and they become better customers and happier because of it, that's our job as a marketeer. But if you start digitally cloning people without permission, and if you start using dead celebrities and these other things, like, which is happening at the moment, I mean, I, I did, um, I did, a, I've written a book about public speaking because it's one of the questions everyone always asks me when I'm doing keynotes: is how do I become a better public speaker, right? And, uh, and so I, I thought it was a great idea. So I, I asked GPT at the time, and I said, look, pretend to be, I you know, Steve Jobs, or pretend to be uh, Martin Luther King, pretend to be these things, like these people. Uh, and look at all their books and their great speeches. And, and then, you know, I'm going to ask you a few questions and come up with some answers, right? That's, I think that's still in the book. I was then going to create a podcast about that and using, cloning their voices and doing that as a podcast. And my, uh, my editor and then my lawyer friend were just like, don't, just don't do that. That's, that's, that's beyond the pale, right? You could get sued horribly for doing this. And I think they were right. It was probably morally wrong, but it would create interesting content. I suppose what I was trying to get to is that the future of a lot of marketing you can start creating videos without the other people. You should always get their consent, yes, but we'll soon be able to create videos without needing to pay for them to be there. Now that's breathtaking. And that's actually why, as you know, uh, Hollywood has started to strike and people have started to shout about this and say, hey, I make money from looking like this and sounding like this. And now anyone can take that and make anything they want from it. Yeah, but if, but if they pay you, for not going, for not traveling, not wasting your time, quote unquote, um, and you can sit at home while your clone is doing the work for you, then it's not so bad. You might have like, uh, have fun. I'm not sure Hollywood is like the best example because they might be having fun anyway with the amount of money they, they make. But, you know, generally for us, for the, you know, for the um, regular people, if I can be at this interview and simultaneously be at another podcast, not as a host, but as an interviewee and doing more, a freelance work somewhere else, then I'll make more money with less time and I'll have more time for my family, for my friends, for my hobbies. I will have some more time to explore new things. This is time. Time is money. This is what we grew up on. Time is money. So if we can make that time count more, that sounds like a fascinating thing that we should try. 
Yeah. Well, exactly that. Right? So a lot of people talk, and we talk about productivity, and I go, look, if you use AI in your marketing, you can become like 40%, up to 400% more productive. And this is what we find when people come to the AI marketing course. And that's great. But my whole point about productivity isn't productivity for productivity's sake, right? Be more productive, do more things, yes, but take back that time and enjoy your life more. You know, enjoy your time on the planet more, not just make more money or be more productive. Now, don't get me wrong, bosses and, and people I talk to in agencies get a bit cross when I say this, but the reality is we should be paying people on outcomes. We should be paying people by objectives, right? This is the objective, this is the outcome, did you do it? Great. Not, ooh, uh, what did you used to do that? Well, that's got nothing to do with you because that's, you know, that's my, that's my own private kingdom. You know, this is why independent, uh, independent intelligence is part of the book of that I'm writing about, the fifth industrial revolution. This is going to be part of it. And this is the organizational bit as well. A lot of leaders and, and bosses of companies are going to have to start to realize that the old way of doing stuff is dead. The employee contract moments, the way of thinking about it is dead. And by the way, that's a good thing. That's great for bosses too, right? That's great for leaders. That's great for the economy. It's great for everything. If we can become more productive, the, the new stats are coming out about Microsoft Copilot as we speak, right? This is Microsoft bringing out AI and putting it into the masses. They are looking at between a 40 to a 70% increase in productivity using AI with the original tools. Okay? Yeah, precisely. 40 to 70%, right? GPT-4, if you use that as a consultant, they, they think it's something between 12 and 50% more productive, depending on where you are and what, what range. Now, that range is awesome. That allows us to then start thinking about the three-day work week, the two-day work week, insanely even the one-day work week. Okay, now with the AI marketing course, that's literally what we try to do. We try to make sure you can get done, you do all your marketing in one day using AI. Now, what you do with the rest of that time, if you're a solo entrepreneur, you're going to fit it in with meeting more people, doing more sales, making more money, you know, broadcasting your message, maybe going on podcasts because, you know, that's another cool thing to do, right? You know, all those other things. Oh, heck, as you rightly said, meeting your family and friends more, becoming a better person, you know, <laughs> meditating more, you know, looking after your health. I mean, all these things that we have been crying out for the last decade saying we need better life work balance. And now we've got this tool that creates it and people are like, oh, um, I don't think we should use it. You know, it's like, what, what, what? We've been looking for this for years. It's appeared like a genie. And then we've said, oh, no, put the genie back in the bottle because that's my job. I really like doing stuff. And you're like, well, you just moaned about the stuff you're doing. Exact, exact same principle with leaders, like leaders who say that they don't have time to manage people, right? But with AI, that now allows you the time to go and talk to people and to man manage them or person manage them, you know, to be a better person, to be more emotionally intelligent. AI gets rid of 80% of your grunt work you don't like doing. I don't understand why there's not more celebration. The, the, the amount of people that aren't using it, and I just did some, uh, some great stats just came out from Ofcom and some other things. I won't bore you with all the details. And I did some stuff on LinkedIn, but it's about, for professionals at the moment, quite a lot of people are using it, but about 20% of people don't use it at all. So 20% of people aren't using AI at all, which is just, it's like saying I don't use computers. And you remember the days when people said, I don't really use computers. I like to still send people by letters. Those people are gone, right? We know that, right? Now, it's the same principle now. And if you're in the world where you're not using, I mean, you don't have to use it on a mobile like I do. You don't have to be super geeky and start creating characters and super prompts and all this other stuff I do. I get that. But just using it, using it in Bing is pretty helpful. You know, that's completely free. Yeah, using ChatGPT4, definitely, please pay for ChatGPT4. I'm not here on behalf of OpenAI. They're a billion dollar company. They don't need my help, right? <laughs> they don't need my help. But the technology is there right now for you to use. Uh, you don't have to go to the extent of using, you know, creating AI influencers. No, but for your marketing, think about how much it can enrich, like the areas of work you don't like doing. Like what's the bit of your life you don't like doing in marketing? Use AI for that bit, yeah? For some reason, we are obsessed with it, creating new images and creating cool stuff and tweets and all this other stuff, the, the bit that human beings love doing. Don't do that. Do the stuff that you don't like doing. Like, I don't like going through all the data. Great. Use Code Interpreter. Get that on going through all your data. I don't like doing the reports. Great. Use AI to do the reports then. You know, whatever it is you don't like doing. It always annoys me a bit at the moment is no one's come up with an AI thing that, that does my taxes for me. I don't like doing that. Why is there not an AI that does it? I quite, I quite like writing tweets. 
I don't like doing my tax returns. <laughs> Why is there not a machine that does that? I think by, in 2024, I think there will be. Yeah, I, I think so too. <laughs> it's coming. It's coming, it's coming. I'm sure, I'm sure. If not, someone from the people who are listening to this now are going to say, oh, wow, I've got the billion dollar idea right now. <laughs> What, all I can say on that one, honestly, AI is a is a tree is a trillion dollar opportunity, and it's putting the you know if you're entrepreneurial enough, or you're lucky enough to know a little bit about coding, and you've got a you know spare bit of time, I would definitely start looking at AI like you know, as soon as but if you're not already doing it as soon as possible, and you know as you rightly we both laughed about, but it's those pain points. Look at the pain points there are in life, and then create them. I created um, a GPT. I've got a, a daughter who's uh, twelve, going on twenty. She's actually thirteen now, so she's even she's even more of a teenager, right? And, and I'm not particularly emotionally intelligent. So I decided, right, what I'll do is I'll take loads of writing from very cool people who've got lots of high reviews on things about teenage daughtering, and I'll put it into a GPT, and I'll, then I'll ask it, and I'll say, hey, what would you do with this situation? And I then followed the advice, and it was great advice. It worked out perfectly for me. It is, it's stuff that I would have never thought about because I, I'm not a teenage daughter expert because I've only got one daughter, and I've never done it before, right? You know? But just preparing, you know, that's a great example, right? Now, if I wanted to, and I've got a couple of friends who have done this as well, they're not coders, but they've started using AI to code stuff for them. And they're now up to a, well, I don't know, none of them are great coders, but they've created stuff that, you know, would have cost £10,000, but they've done it themselves with no knowledge of code. Yeah. Now, the clever people amongst you would say, ah, well, what happens when it breaks? Because they don't know what they've built. And that's a really good point. You know, they haven't, they don't know why it breaks. And so they have to get a coder in to really fix it. But I almost think it's slightly redundant because I know that they've also learned more about coding by building than they most probably ever would have just by learning coding, if that makes sense, like going to university. And these people have done it. I've got a, a female friend of mine who's done it. And she, you know, to the extent that it's an amazing bit of kit that she's built for herself. And by the way, she's only built it for herself to make herself better at marketing. It's just a CRM system that uses data. But it uses her data and the company's data, and it does it in a better way than other things did. Now, that's most probably the future of work for a lot of us, is building these clever AI machines. But they're only, being, they're only for us. They're not for everybody else. So the next bit of the future of work, as you rightly said before, is going to be how do we learn to talk and work with these machines? But also, I'll say on top of that is, how do you do it in a way that that becomes your intellectual property? that becomes the thing you take with you to your next job. Yeah, that becomes the thing that you become known for. And then people go, oh, right, who do I use? Well, I use Dan. Why did you use Dan Sodium? Well, because he did this thing for us. It was amazing. But they don't need to know how you did that thing. That's your secret. That's your, you know, that's your secret source. That's your magic, right? And you can take that to multiple clients. And that's the most exciting bit. It's not just using the AI that comes out of the box, but how do you tinker with it? How do you play with it? How do you put in proprietary data? How do you put in special abilities? And I hate to say the word prompt engineering, because a lot of people are pursuing it, but this all starts off with some knowledge around prompt and prompt engineering. It starts off with some base knowledge about how you do this, which is what we teach on the AI marketing course, of course. But deeper than that, it comes from a innate curiosity around things. Like if you're not naturally curious about how you can become better as a person and want personal growth, then I can see why AI is an issue because it's a stretch. You know, it's good to biggie. And it's only, you know, it's only been around for, well, it's been around for 12 or 14 years, but we've only really seen it in marketing over the next, or publicly knowing that we've seen it in marketing for maybe nine months, right? It's all new to us. It's all moving very quickly. But that's about your growth mindset. AI is the opportunity of a lifetime for all marketeers, especially if you're freelancing, especially if you are in the gig economy, this changes everything. This now means that every marketing individual becomes a marketing agency. But they only do that if they want to. Right, then. Any last insight you want to share before we finish our interview? So it's going to be really interesting in the 2024 and the future. We're doing an event called Future 24 over in the UK, which is going to be, uh, maybe we might stream it, we might not. But the point being is, it's a variety of different speakers all talking about the future of work. Have a look at it, worth looking at. My point though around this is in this future, this future of 2024, using AI and using technology will be the thing that will make a difference to you in your career. It will be the moment 
which transports you to a completely different level of understanding. Now, what's exciting about that is not just the fact that you're gonna be using technology and using AI to make your lives better, but it also makes your clients' lives better too. It makes business better. And this is my point though, is I believe that in making business better, we actually make the world better too. And if we can make the world better using technology, I truly believe that's the point of technology. You know, we can remote work more. We can be better for the environment. We can work less time and be nicer to our friends and family. We can do things with our lives that we could never do before because we could become more productive, not just using AI, but using AI and our own creativity to make the world and a better place. And hopefully, I hope our own lives better. And uh, hey, let's be honest, let's be customer centric, the lives of our customers too. Dan Sodergan, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. It was a real pleasure hosting you in Hustle Pro. Um, learned a lot. Thank you. No problem. If anyone wants to find out more, of course, come and find me on LinkedIn. Uh, my name's a bit complicated. It's just Dan and then S-O-D-E-R-G-R-E-N. And then it's just dansodergan.com uh, if you want to follow some of my ramblings and insane thoughts on the internet too.